Good morning. We are starting the SEG November lecture uh, with Professor Katarina Taiwa. Um, we are just waiting a few moments to see if uh, more people come in. Uh, welcome everyone and thank you for your interest uh, in uh, the College of Global Studies uh, lecture today. Uh, this is uh, a pleasure for us to have uh, Professor Katrina here with us. Uh, we are very privileged to learn from such experienced uh, and uh, distinguished academic from the Nas Australian National University. Uh, SEG, uh, the College of Global Studies, is a forum created uh, at the Centre de Estudos Sociais uh, with the objective of promoting critical debates uh, on the process of globalization and the main problems of the contemporary world. So uh, her, her topic is very relevant uh, for uh, our times and, and specifically this time of uh, we are facing uh, with climate change uh, and all the discussions around it. Uh, we have um, her presenting today about the Pacific people's histories and contemporary activism for environment and self-determination. Um, and she uh, is uh, also um, uh, it was really good that she could participate, uh, even from you know a far away place from Portugal, um, and and at such a late hour in Australia. So thank you, Prof Professor Katrina Teiwa, for uh, agreeing to be here uh, at the late hour. Um, we present you. I will brief you, briefly present you um, and your experience. So. Uh, Katrina Tewa is a professor of Pacific Studies in the School of Culture, History and Language of the Australian National University. She was born and raised in Fiji and is of Banaban, Tavi Tewan, I'm not sure I pronounced correctly, uh, an African-American heritage. Her research extends from histories of phosphate mining in Oceania to Pacific arts, culture, environment, regionalism and activism. She is a practicing artist touring a research-based multimedia exhibition project Banava, curated by Yuki Kihara. Katarina has won two national teaching excellence awards, including Australian University Teacher of the Year 2021 uh, from Universities Australia. And so uh, Maori Professor Katarina, uh, we are very uh, pleased to, to hear you today. We give the floor to Professor Katerina. Thank you. Kabna Maori and Nisam Bolivinaka. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you to all of you for inviting me to speak to you today, um, uh, to do this lecture and the workshop tomorrow. And I'm really sorry I can't be there in person. I think it would have been amazing and wonderful um, to travel to Portugal. I've never been to Portugal before. Um, but these are challenging times still, even though I know there are a lot of people traveling the world now. Um, but I think we all have, have had different experiences of the pandemic and also of this idea of our interconnectedness. And also now we have all of this technology where we can uh, talk to each other across the planet. So on this occasion, um, I was unable to come to Portugal, but I am um, coming to you from the unceded lands of the Nunawal and the Nambri peoples of um, what is now the Australian Capital Territory in Canberra. And I just wanna pay my respects um, to their elders um, and um, just state, you know, very clearly again, all of us living and working in Australia um, live on unceded Aboriginal um, and Torres Strait lands. Um, and I will be talking a bit about land and ocean today. Um, so I'm going to um, talk for uh, just under an hour and um, I have lots of wonderful images and text um, to help us along. Um, uh, in the first bit, it'll be a, a bit of a more general overview uh, of the Pacific, especially for those who may not know that much about the Pacific. Um, 
And I guess talking about the Pacific from a very interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary perspective, um, even though I have a PhD uh, in anthropology, I um, all my research, all my writing and all my teaching is very much in an interdisciplinary or a transdisciplinary mode. Um, and that's the mode I'm most comfortable in. So I am not wedded to one or another discipline. Um, but really all my work is dedicated to the Pacific. Um, and the Pacific means different things from, you know, in different parts of the world and from different perspectives and viewpoints. So this opening slide, uh, which is screenshots from Twitter, um, kind of represents um, different ways of imagining the Pacific. So I loved this post um, because a lot of maps of the world center the continents, center lands, make the continents and the land masses look a lot bigger than they actually are. And the ways in which our world is framed really impacts the ways in which people think about and imagine and prioritize different parts of the world, different populations, and make decisions about what's important and what's not important. And often size is important. The size and the scale of land masses and populations is deemed to be important. So they often think of the Pacific as some sort of big blank space. And they think about the ocean as a big, big blank space. But climate change more than anything has taught us that um, the ocean is actually the regulating factor of the whole climate. So now there's a bit of a rush to try to understand the ocean and understand very big bodies of water that people otherwise, um, you know, uh, uh, deprioritized in their framing and their understanding and their conceptualization of of the world and of humanity. And now um, there are so many different projects or trying to um, bring the ocean back into perspective in the way that this post has done. But what they see and what they engage and what they understand from Oceania tends to be quite different. So I was, um, I've added some of the responses that people gave to this question, uh, to this post about um, a view of the earth centering the world, you know, what do you see? Like, so for me, that's my response at the top, which is, this is where we come from. We come from this part of the world. Um, this part of the world, which is really one third of the planet, one, one third of the whole planet is the Pacific, not the ocean, but just the Pacific. So the Pacific is actually a profoundly important part of the whole entire planet, not a distant part, not a faraway part, not some paradise on the other side of the planet. It is one third of the whole entire globe. So that's the first thing that kind of people are like, whoa, what does that mean? I, I, I see the map and the ocean is falling off the side of the map, right? So those maps are very skewed. Um, so some of the responses by people from the Pacific were like deep salty water, I can see and almost taste and smell and hear home. And then I thought, you know, one of the responses was very telling, all I can see are, are New Zealand and Canada. That's, that's what they see when they look at this because they're looking for the land. They're like, nothing is important unless there's land involved. So, so they see an empty space and they're hunting for the lands which are on the margin. And then somebody who's really from the Pacific is like, oh, I can see Kiribati, Hawaii, Tuvalu, Tonga, Fiji, Marshall Islands, Cook Islands, and many, many more islands that I cannot visit um, because I live on the other side of the world. But most of us, when we look at this, we see 22 nation states and territories. Other people may not see them, but we can see them. There's more than 22, there's 25, there's tens of thousands of islands. So that's the part of the world we come from and the way we experience um, everything really. So the other um, way I wanted to start this is um, thinking about why I came into the academy in the first place, how, how I, um, you know, I, I ended up becoming a scholar and a teacher in the university. And, you know, again, because my background is in anthropology, I've heard many different reasons for why people become academics, um, ranging from, I closed my eyes, I put my hand over my eyes, I spun the globe and I pointed to some corner of it 
and I packed my bags and there I went <laughs> off to study the other um, all the way down to someone like me or and a lot of indigenous peoples um, who are in the academy not all of them because we're talking about extremely um, diverse reasons for why you know we would enter the academy in the first place but mine really was similar um, to uh, Dr. Chelsea uh, Watego who is an aboriginal scholar which is I, I came into the academy, I did a master's and I went on to a PhD because I was concerned about the survival of my people. I was concerned about learning more about who we were, where we came from, how we ended up in Fiji in the first place because I knew we were indigenous people but we were not indigenous to Fiji. We were a minority in Fiji. We were a, a minority amongst many in Fiji and we weren't learning much about who we were and where we came from in primary school and secondary school. So I would just hear bits and pieces from the grown ups and from my father and from his family. And I knew we were from Kiribati, which was is not close to Fiji at all and not always easy to get to from Fiji, um, but I didn't know why or how we ended up in Fiji. I knew something bad had happened on our home island. And I knew that the, the land had been decimated um, by mining, but I didn't know anything about this mining or this phosphate or much about it at all. So this is why I continued studying after doing an undergraduate uh, degree in combined sciences um, I went on to do a master's in Pacific Island studies, and then suddenly I started to learn about who we were and where we came from, and it was like it blew my mind. All of a sudden, um, higher education went from sort of relevant to extremely, extremely relevant to me. Um, so I'm in the academy for personal reasons, for communal reasons, for family reasons. Um, and that's often what brings many Pacific people into the humanities and social sciences. So just a little bit more of a background because everything I do, uh, it matters how I'm positioned and how I'm situated in Oceania and in the world um, more generally because who I am is a map and this map is very, very relevant to my research. It's a very multi-sided identity and the kind of work I do is also very multi-sided where many parts of the Pacific are kind of coordinated um, in cartographic terms based on very particular colonial and imperial histories, ones that are very much of uh, about environmental ex extraction, um, extraction of natural resources, and the impact of that extraction and the impact of the displacement of peoples uh, who are moved around because of this extraction of their of their resources of their in our case of their lands. So we live in Fiji, so that's one of the um, triangles, the yellow triangles on the map, Fiji, which is sort of in the center. And then just to the northwest of Fiji um, are the Gilbert Islands, which are part of Kiribati. Kiribati is just the Gilbertese way of saying uh, Gilbert Islands, but obviously Gilbert is not the indigenous term uh, for Kiribati or for the Gilbert Islands. The original uh, name was Tungaru, um, referring to the number of islands in Kiribati. But our island is to the far west um, of Kiribati, and that is Banaba. Banaba doesn't show up on, on many maps, but through my research and through my studies, I very much brought, uh, made Banaba much more visible uh, in Pacific studies. Um, so the triangle to the Northwest is, is where our ancestral lands are. Um, you can see Hawaii um, to the Northeast, and that's a very important place to us because not only is it a place where many in my family did our tertiary um, education, it's also where my, my parents met and married. Um, my mother was from the East Coast of the United States, from Washington, DC, from an African-American military family. Um, and she met my father who was from Fiji and Kiribati in Hawaii. And Hawaii is where our family started and many of us uh, continued to go back to Hawaii over the years to do our studies. 
Um, I also taught at the University of Hawaii for many years. So it's, it's a place that's very uh, important and meaningful to our family. Um, it's also a place where there are many um, populations of, of Portuguese uh, descent, <laughs> um, but that's another, another story, um, you know, uh, labor migration of Portuguese to Hawaii uh, to work on um, the plantations there. Then the other two sites that are important in my work are Australia and Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, so Australia, um, where I'm based now, um, and where uh, the, the company that did the mining on our home island um, was owned by Australia, New Zealand, and Great Britain. So it was very much a multinational corporation that um, you know, started mining in 1900, and a lot of our lands went to Australia, New Zealand, and a lot of the archives about this history are also in Australia and New Zealand and also England. Um, but in my work, I focused mainly on Australia and New Zealand and the ways in which they relate to um, our story, to our history, and to our ancestral lands. So all my work is kind of like a coordination between between these sites uh, on this map. Um, so just a little bit of background on the Pacific, just to kind of situate things um, a little bit. And then uh, later I will zoom in a bit more into my own specific work, um, which will tell a, a deeper story about Banaba, the island I come from. So I teach introduction um, to Pacific studies. And for me, it's really important um, that, you know, people understand that, you know, the Pacific is a very interesting place where um, we have these long and deep histories of indigeneity and of belonging to our islands. But we also know that you know, we come from other places and that there have been waves of migration, um, many of them long before Europeans uh, or, or other populations ever explored uh, the planet. Um, there have been waves of migration into the Pacific that are, form part of our heritage. And our heritage is very, very important and it's very um, long and it's deep. Um, meaning we don't just think about who we are like a hundred years ago, we think about who we are in, in the thousands of years. So the thousands of years or deep time actually matters to Pacific people because we think still in ancestral terms and in ancestral ways, even as we navigate the present and even as we're thinking about um, solutions to the, the challenges of the present or of the future. Um, so this map is just one that shows one particular wave of migration uh, or what linguists, linguists and archaeologists believe is part of the migration, which is that of the Austronesian um, people that connects the Pacific um, to um, Southeast Asia and all the way um, to Madagascar. Um, that's, that constitutes one aspect of Pacific heritage in deep time. But in Pacific Island studies, which is the field that I work in, we tend to focus mainly on the regions that constitute Micronesia, Melanesia, and Polynesia. So east, just a bit east of um, Southeast Asia or East Asia is where we tend to focus. Um, when big powers are talking their geopolitics, <laughs> they, they extend their map into what they call the Indo-Pacific because that's where they center a lot of the, the tensions and the anxieties around um, thinking about who's controlling um, things economically, uh, in terms of uh, defense and security. They like this concept of the Indo-Pacific and um, of controlling the Indo-Pacific region. But we in Pacific Island Studies tend to focus more on just the Pacific um, part of that equation. And we also think about how our, um, our ancestral connections go back to this period, um, which is over 3000 years ago, um, with that Austronesian migration out of East Asia and Southeast Asia into the Pacific, but there are much older populations in the Pacific that are even older than those 3000 year old um, migrations. And those are the um, many of the communities in Melanesia and particularly uh, Papua New Guinea who have been there over 50,000 years 
um, in very similar ways to Aboriginal um, peoples who have also uh, been on their lands for a long, long period of time. So there's a lot of diversity in Oceania, um, but there's also a lot of similarity. And that's kind of what, that is the glue that holds together a lot of our thinking and a lot of our values um, in the region and also in Pacific Island studies, especially Pacific Island studies from an indigenous um, perspective. Now, that indigenous uh, perspective within Pacific studies has very much been shaped and framed in not necessarily uh, in in um, always in reaction to the way in which Europeans have named and framed the Pacific, but probably also to go a bit further in with resistance <laughs> to the ways in which um, the Pacific has been mapped, <laughs> named and framed by all of these men, many, many European men who have, you know, quote unquote, discovered the Pacific uh, after people already discovered it thousands of years before them, um, but the, their terms for the Pacific have really stuck. Um, so I, I, I try to ensure that my students understand the genealogy of the word Pacific, of this term South Pacific and where it comes from, because of course it's been shaped by Spanish and Portuguese uh, navigators and sailors and so-called explorers, uh, particularly uh, uh, de Balboa, uh, who first quote unquote discovered the big South Sea uh, because he was looking South when he saw uh, the Pacific, but of course the Pacific is North, South, East, West, all directions. But because of his vantage point um, in the Americas, when he saw the Pacific Ocean for the first time, he was like, oh, this is one big so Southern, big South Ocean. And that term South stuck. Um, and it's been hooked into the term, the Pacific, which of course comes from Ferdinand Magellan, um, from his voyage through the Pacific in the 1500s. He so his peaceful, very peaceful voyage until he got to the end of his voyage and unfortunately lost his life, or fortunately, depends on your perspective. Um, but these term, the Pacific and the South Sea get combined into the, the concept of the South Pacific, which really uh, sticks when it comes to uh, European and other imaginations of the South Pacific and the kinds of images of paradise and palm trees and all kinds of things that it, um, it conjures up and in a way births a whole bunch of disciplines um, thinking about that part of the world. Um, so I won't talk too much about James Cook because uh, eh, most of us are way over <laughs> James Cook and everything he did in the Pacific, but his mapping <laughs> opened up the way for more colonization. How great, how wonderful. Um, but the, the person that I tend to focus, uh, the work that I tend to focus on is that of Dumont d'Urville, just because these terms that he created for the Pacific in the 1800s, which are Melanesia, Micronesia and Polynesia have become these real identities that have kind of stuck. Um, in the Pacific and, ha and Pacific Islanders themselves have taken on and have owned in many ways. And they're, they have both positive and some negative and problematic um, connotations and aspects to them. Um, uh, but this is how we tend to think of the Pacific today in uh, Deville's terms with this big Polynesian triangle, uh, this smaller Micronesian region, and then this Black Pacific, um, which is Melanesia. And this is the map we tend to use a lot in Pacific studies. And we interrogate it, we reflect on it, we think about it, and we think about the region as a whole and not just the individual bits. Like sometimes we zoom in into different countries because you know, it's better to do uh, research at a at a very local level, but there's a lot of um, kind of multi-scalar um, movements uh, in Pacific Island studies in and out of islands and thinking between islands um, often. Um, 
so some of these ideas though about Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia are also unfortunately hooked into other kinds of thinking about, you know, uh, racialized thinking and gendered thinking about the Pacific, um, where terms such as savage, native, primitive, exotic, underdeveloped, which was similar thinking uh, in other parts of what people now think of as third or fourth worlds, um, those have also really shaped our histories and also shaped the ways in which contemporary Pacific scholars have tried to reimagine and resist um, some of these framings that come out of this genealogy, um, beginning with um, European explorers. Um, I won't go into this um, in too much detail um, because we definitely don't have time for that, but um, more recent contemporary history really shapes the kind of um, the kind of activism and the kind of uh, anti-colonial or decolonial work um, that began, you know, definitely in the before the 1800s in different parts of the Pacific, and certainly, you know, Guam was colonized um, in the 1500s, and resistance to that. Um, Spanish colonization started then and has, you know, it's never, never stopped throughout the Pacific, but probably more in the 1800s and the 1900s after we've had waves of, um, you know, whalers, beachcombers, traders, uh, uh, missionaries. We've had all kinds of diseases introduced that have had calamitous um, impacts on Pacific populations we find this beginning of, uh, you know, resistance amongst Pacific Islanders to these constant waves of exploration, discovery, settlement, colonization, and the ways in which Europeans and, and um, others try to kind of reshape the lives of islanders on the ground through different things like the establishment of plantations, all kinds of trading activities, moving islanders around so that they can work on their plantations. There was a whole slave trade in the Pacific where people were kidnapped and taken to lots of different places from Peru uh, to Australia and elsewhere, kidnapped to work on other plantations. Um, Pacific Islanders' lives were really, you know, like kind of thrown up by um, all of the, these constant waves of, of um, Europeans, Japanese, and others who were, you know, coming into the Pacific looking for um, certain kinds of resources um, to, to trade and to uh, make profit off of, and, and also, of, you know, certain settler colonial um, communities that were established. Um, probably the biggest impact in the Pacific, though, that really changed it from a particular kind of island environment to one of, you know, increasing and intense globalization was World War II, when the whole of the, you know, half of World War II was actually fought and battled in the Pacific, not just um, on the continents, but right in the middle of the ocean where islands became these were transformed overnight sometimes into ports and towns and sites where um, uh, the allies needed everything from rest and recreation to um, they needed supplies. So they became critical nodes in the supply chains for the war. And, you know, what used to be villages or um, small family Kainga in different islands suddenly had to be amalgamated into these towns that were governable, that needed infrastructure, that had roads and all kinds of things. And in a way, this kind of happens overnight in many Pacific islands where it's like, hello, they're building stuff. Like, oh, hello, there is an airport here. <laughs> what is this? Um, and you see this in Pacific um, oral, oral culture where you still have dances, for example, da dances and songs in Fiji about people seeing airplanes for the first time because they didn't know what these things were and they came to the islands and that's because they built a big airport in Fiji and Fiji kind of be became this like central hub for, for the war effort. The war didn't come to Fiji, but Fiji was like a staging uh, or, or a midpoint or a staging point for a lot of um, 
um, services and materials that were required for the war. So this happens all over the Pacific. And unfortunately, a lot of this leads to nuclear testing in the Pacific as well, because the Pacific then becomes this critical space between the United States, Asia, and Europe, like this one big space where um, you had to figure out whether you could launch your intercontinental ballistic missiles and also figure out um, how effective your nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction could be by, by testing them in the Pacific or by setting up critical um, bases, uh, defense points, security points for big powers in order to anticipate or plan um, for future wars that may be waged, um, again, on the continents. <laughs> Um, so the Pacific becomes this incredible, critical, geopolitical, securitized space for the rest of the world. And often without any uh, participation or, or without any, um, you know, nobody asks Pacific Islanders what they want. <laughs> You know, they they don't ask them. Do you want Do you want any of this? They they unfortunately in many places rock up on the island, plant the flag, and all the ships start arriving. And that's not to downplay Pacific Islanders' agency in any of these you know big imperial and colonial activities, but but actually to say the sheer scale of interest and engagement from the outside world in the Pacific in many places where they hadn't seen, you know, white people, like seeing white people for the first time um, rocking up to the islands, um, that sheer uh, imbalance of power is felt quite acutely um, on small islands because um, just of the sheer distance, you know, from these central metropolitan powers where all of these decisions are being made. So far away in, in, in imagination and understanding of the Pacific, but so central and critical and important to the big empires that end up uh, dominating the planet. So that's where you see on the ground in the Pacific Islands, different forms of, of resistance to colonialism, globalization, development, all of these things that kind of try to connect the Pacific to the rest of the world. And these play out in many different ways in different parts of the Pacific, because even though all the islands are connected, especially genealogically, um, and, and ancestrally uh, to each other, uh, linguistically and culturally, um, different islands, depending on their, on their size, depending on which imperial or colonial power is exercising that power in that part of the world, different forms of resistance and, and different forms of anti-colonial work and behavior um, emerge from different parts of the Pacific. Um, and so you, you also have that dy dynamic between the kinds of work that are being done in towns and cities and metropolitan centers that are emerging versus those that are being done, you know, in outer islands or what people might imagine as rural or um, other sorts of parts of the Pacific. Um, so that's that's the condensed form. Uh, that's the condensed version of Pacific history, which unfortunately I, I can't go into um, in broader detail, but there are many, this is a really handy um, map of the current political status of Pacific Islands, just to show you the difference in terms of those who have real independence and those who have semi-autonomy or semi-independence and are still ongoing attached to particular uh, former or current colonial powers um, and those then that don't have much autonomy uh, or independence at all which are um, at the bottom with Hawaii, Rapa Nui and West Papua. Um, but you have some that have uh, independence, which is Nauru, PNG, Samoa, Fiji, Tonga, Tuvalu, Solomon Islands, Kiribati, Vanuatu. Um, and then you have some which are in the sphere of influence of particular countries, such as Cook Islands, Niue, Tokelau, Pitcairn, um, and those like uh, French Polynesia, New Caledonia, Wallace and Futuna, which are still French 
territories. Um, so still part of, of, of France in that um, colonial sense. And then those which are deeply linked, especially politically and especially in terms of defense and security to the United States, um, which is um, Marshall Islands, um, Federated States of Micronesia, Palau, and then even more, more in terms of being part of the territory of the United States with American Samoa, Guam and the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas. And, and, this, and those three are particularly militarized in that they are important, um, they're either important bases or they're important sources of, of um, personnel uh, and a lot of uh, military recruitment happens um, um, on those islands, but they don't get to vote for president of the United States. Um, so it's that sort of relationship. So the Pacific is this really, you know, complex space then where you have all of this diversity, you have all of these different kinds of metropolitan and imperial um, uh, powers kind of, you know, operating, operating in the Pacific. Um, and you have all of this complexity on the ground. So what people often think is a very simple space, like, oh, the Pacific, oh, so nice, Fiji. Samoa da, 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 is actually complex in terms of history, in terms of all of these different things that um, Pacific people have to navigate, including now China, which is like the latest big thing um, that people are constantly talking about as having um, vested interests in the Pacific. Um, the last thing I want to say in terms of this, just this um, framing bit of Oceania is, is there are all these terms, all these names and frames for the Pacific that are operating at the same time. And that kind of shows you then how complex it is and how people have to like navigate all of these different views of this one massive large ocean. So this is kind of like a genealogy of all the ways in which people talk about the Pacific, how they make meaning in the Pacific, whether they're calling it the South Seas, South Pacific, Pacific Islands, Pacific Rim, Asia Pacific, Austronesia, uh, a sea of islands, Indo-Pacific, Blue Pacific, small island states, big ocean states, so many names and frames um, to think about Oceania. And this is what islanders are, are often um, navigating and um, contending with in their in their uh, daily lives at different scales. Um, some of the amazing people who have kind of theorized and um, but often in very literary and creative ways have kind of unpacked these ideas of what the Pacific is and then reframed it in indigenous and Pacific terms include uh, people like um, the, the writer um, and poet Albert Went, um, who is um, Samoan. And so Pacific Islanders like uh, um, Albert Went and scholars have found really interesting ways to talk about their identities as belonging not just to their particular cultures, not just belonging to their particular islands, but belonging to the whole of Oceania. So I won't read this whole quote, but he wrote a very famous piece where he talks about belonging to Oceania, the whole of it, and not just the Samoan part of it, which is how most people um, might tend to think. So he, he was very transformative um, in Pacific Island studies, um, along with Epelihau Ofa, who is Tongan, and but was raised in Papua New Guinea, and then ended up living for most of his life in Fiji, he again had this very multi-sided view of Pacific identities as not just belonging to one part of Oceania, but belonging to the whole of Oceania. Um, and he talked about talked about Oceania in really profound and amazing ways, describing it as vast, expanding, hospitable, generous, all of these amazing things, which often attract people um, to the Pacific. So apparently how, how Offa's work has be, been very critical and amazing in Pacific studies. Um, and then you have people like the amazing um, Haunani K. Trask, um, who was part of thinking more specifically about 
particular kinds of resistance in Oceania and resistance to colonialism, um, who did a lot of important uh, decolonial thinking and uh, work from a Hawaiian um, perspective, where she kind of, again, reframes this idea of belonging to this ocean uh, in terms of the ways in which we need to defend and fight back. Uh, in order to reclaim the ocean, especially from all of these colonial and imperial forces uh, that have been operating in the Pacific. So Hananike Trask was very critical um, to that thinking. And then the last person I wanna highlight is my sister, um, Teresia, um, and, and all of these amazing thinkers un unfortunately have passed away. Um, some of them, you know, quite, quite young, like my sister, who, who framed our belonging to Oceania in, in very poetic terms, um, talking about it um, in terms of the fact that we sweat and cry salt water so that we know that the ocean is really in our blood. Um, and so it's a different way of thinking about belonging, which I think um, sometimes is quite challenging for those who are used to thinking about lands and landscapes as the basis for their identity, their belonging or their values. Um, and to belong to a more fluid part of the world is truly, um, you know, a, a, a different sense of, of, of being and knowing. Um, so the Pacific therefore is very inspiring in many ways. Um, I'm currently the art editor for the Contemporary Pacific Journal, which, which I highly recommend to people who to, um, learn more. Um, but these are some of the covers of our amazing journal featuring um, artists from the Pacific. And one of the very interesting features of Pacific studies for me is the fact that artists and scholars are often the same people or are often thinking together about the Pacific. So you don't always have this separation between social scientists and humanities and artists, but again, this very interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary way of thinking about the Pacific in, ve in very creative ways, along with the, you know, some of the more critical, um, you know, critical thinking uh, about the Pacific, this need constantly to to invoke the beauty and the power and the profound nature of Oceania along with thinking about figuring out how we can fight to defend it as well. So kind of combining all of those different um, skills and values. Um, this is the wonderful work of Joy Enomoto featuring a, a jellyfish, which I don't have time to go into, but I encourage you to um, read a bit more about. So um, just finally, um, I just wanna spend the last um, 10 minutes or so talking about my work and the way in which I kind of weave, you know, some of the things I've just talked about and described in terms of the broader issues in the Pacific into my own thinking, kind of zooming into one particular part of the Pacific, which is the one that uh, my family belongs to, which is Banaba. So we, we also have, uh, you know, ancestors who come from Tabitewea, um, uh, which is in another part of Kiribati, um, but a lot of my, my work and my thinking and my art uh, is inspired by Banaban histories. And you won't find Banaba on a map because it's six square kilometers. <laughs> it's two and a half square miles. That's the whole, that's the whole island. And there isn't another island anywhere nearby. So when you stand on Banaba, you can turn 360 degrees and you won't see another, another piece of land. So it is truly in the middle of the ocean, near the equator, like in the middle of the earth. Um, Banabans call it the navel, the navel of, of their world, right? So right uh, from the belly button, a place that gives birth to, to Banabans and Banaba means the rock. So people from Banaba are the people of the rock who belong to the, the rock, this rock that's surrounded by um, a massive ocean. So that's where a lot of my, um, my thinking has come from and very much shaped by belonging um, to a very large Banaban family. So this is just a small <laughs> number of my family members. Um, my father had nine brothers and sisters. So there were 10 
children and he is the oldest um uh child and the uh, oldest son and um I have 50 first cousins and they all have many children um so that's why I'm saying this is just a small <laughs> section of our family um but they've really um you know kind of shaped my identity and shaped my thinking about who we are and where we come from and when I do my work I have our people in mind almost as my first audience before I think of who else is reading this and who else cares about what I write <laughs> and what I do, because my work has to mean something to our people. Um, and thankfully, therefore, it, it becomes transformative for others. How great. But, you know, as a scholar, I, I'm, I'm not someone who looks into the genealogy of thought of anthropology or history or sociology and tries to fit my work into these genealogies because I already have a GG that goes back to places in the Pacific. So um, I was just, uh, let me know if it drops out again, but I was just talking about how my work is primarily, you know, has my family and my community um, in mind. And this is just some members of, of my family, including my parents. And um, they've very much been on this journey of scholarship with me. Um, the other issue is that even though um, this island that I'm going to talk about, um, the mining, uh, which I've been writing about for a long time, occurred from 1900 to 1980. So it's sort of this mining operation that happened in the past. It's become very relevant again in the present because the island has actually run out of fresh drinking water. So sometimes people kind of think about the past and, and the bad colonial things that happened in the past and say, oh, well, you know, moving on into the future, we can't dwell on the past. It was our ancestors who did those bad things and not us, but the islands which have been impacted by the activities during the colonial and the imperial period are still suffering. They still have ongoing problems, environmental, social, political, and economic that still need to be addressed. And climate change has actually exacerbated all of those problems and made them worse. So Banaba came back into the news, even though it's something that people tend to think of as more historical, came back into the news because it ran out of drinking water. And, you know, people started um, worrying about, uh, you know, again, worrying about um, the fact that people on the island um, couldn't have access to water. Um, there was also not, not long after that, and all of this was happening during the pandemic, another story came out about Banaba talking about how there was a massive food shortage and a food crisis and people <laughs> didn't have enough to eat. Um, so yeah, Banaba has been in the news recently because of um, running out of water and running out of food. So, so Banaba was critical because it's a, an important, uh, it's made purely out of phosphate. Most of the island is made out of phosphate. And this is what phosphate is. It is something that's actually critical um, to Earth's ecological cycle. Um, and it's something that's been harnessed by mass agriculture to increase um, the productivity of, of mass agriculture. So even though Banaba was this very small place in the Pacific, it was actually critical to global agriculture because of this science that I don't have uh, too much time to go into, but just giving you, you know, a bit of a background and a context to why Banaba was mined out and a lot of the land was taken and removed from the island because most of the island is made from phosphate. And the phosphate it's made from has two sources, one which is bird droppings and the other which is dead um, marine life. And so it takes millions of years to grow an island like this, but it was mined out and decimated in just around 80 years. So it's kind of this really disturbing par parable um, for so many things, whether it's colonialism, imperialism, globalization, mass agriculture, uh, the Anthropocene, <laughs> climate change, all the things that feed into climate change like mass agriculture. Um, 
Banaba kind of is a microcosm of all of those big, uh, much more global events, but they kind of happen on this tiny island. Um, so this is what part of the island looks like now, unfortunately, and, and these are our um, ancestral lands, which Banabans who belong to the rock kind of conceptualized um, in these terms as, as, you know, us belonging to this land that then gets devastated um, by phosphate mining. And Barnabans very much resisted this um, and tried to sue the governments that were responsible for mining, which was Great Britain, Australia, and New Zealand, um, and kind of re reached the peak of, um, you know, activism in the, in the 1900s, in the 1970s, when they um, sued the company and sued the British government for what had happened to the island, which was very much um, destroyed by phosphate mining. So a lot of my work explores these archives and these histories and tells the story again, but on our own, um, on our own terms. Um, so, um, you know, I have lots of uh, complex thinking about what it means to belong to an island that has been dispersed uh, through phosphate uh, fertilizer and through agriculture and kind of spread across other people's lands and then enter the food chain and become part of these commodity chains that get consumed by others while there's not enough food on the island itself for people to eat and not enough water. Like it's again kind of a, a really stark uh, kind of parable of what's happening all around the planet. Um, so I wrote a book called Consuming Ocean Island because I thought, thought a lot about how the world was eating, eating our island. Um, I wrote about it um, and I also made art um, out of it or I worked with artists to kind of tell this story through other platforms and in other modes um, and disseminate the story more widely. Um, because not many people had heard about Banaba, you know, let alone Kiribati before climate change um, became, you know, so much more visible. Um, so, and I just want to end with some of these images of uh, an exhibition, and I'll talk more about this exhibition tomorrow for those who are doing the workshop. Um, I'll go into it in more detail, but because I work in a very interdisciplinary mode and I have a creative uh, and performing arts background, I was always thinking about, you know, my eth ethnographic work and my archival work on Banaba, how can I share this story more widely to the public and not just put it in journals and books and things like that. Um, so I worked with Yuki Kihara uh, to transform this into a multimedia exhibition. Um, which has now been in, in a few galleries in Australia and New Zealand. And in it, I bring our people, the Banabans, especially our ancestors together with the land um, or what's left of the land, which is pinnacles. So these are just some images of Project Banaba, which I, I started doing in 2017 and it's had various iterations and I always transform it to, to tell stories of the site in which the, the exhibition is based um, and the space that we're, that we're working with um, as well. And I kind of use um, words and quotes and images from the archives and put it together so that people have this experience of what happened to the island and you know, kind of think and reflect on, on what's happening in the world more broadly um, in terms of environmental um, destruction. Um, so yeah, I'm just I'm just sh sharing some of these images. You know, uh, phosphate is still a critical issue around the planet, um, and you know, there's a big phosphate mining happening in Western Sahara, and there the indigenous people of that region call it blood phosphate because it's also um, you know devastating and decimating their lives. So it's not just a Pacific story, but uh, it's a global story. But phosphate is not something that a lot of people think much about, <laughs> even though it's actually quite critical um, to life on Earth. Um, so yeah, these are just some images of my of my uh, exhibition, and um, I think I will stop there because I've gone slightly over time, even though we started um, a little bit late. But I do want to have 
some time um, for discussion. Um, so I've kind of given you a bit of a big picture of the Pacific um, and some of the dynamics and the issues that have been going on, you know, historically, and then kind of tried to zoom in a little bit on, you know, some of the critical issues facing communities like mine today, where, you know, the environmental issues are really kind of blowing up and, and, and they've come to a critical point now um, where, yeah, places like this in the Pacific become these, these microcosms for, you know, what's happening um, around the planet. But because we're in an oceanic space and not on a, a terrestrial, you know, predominantly a continental or land dominated space, these histories give us these opportunities to kind of rethink um, maybe some of the solutions or some of the, um, you know, ways in which we can change our, our thinking so that we don't keep re repeating the mistakes of the past, I suppose. Um, you know, that's what I think the Pacific can do for the world. Um, yeah, so that one of my exhibitions I did right down the road from a phosphate phosphate factory. So this, this is just a picture of the phosphate factory. And they weren't very happy that we we tried to come to and visit their phosphate factory. They wouldn't let us anywhere near it. But I had my exhibition, my critical uh, phosphate fertilizer exhibition running five minutes down the road from, from this big factory um, in New Zealand. So yeah. Um, Thank you so much.